so, uh, so today, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, this uh, magic material, right? Graphene, but in a new form. Uh, uh, and uh, the experiments came earlier uh, this year that uh, showing that uh, uh, it's both conductor, but it can be turned into an insulator and a sugnator, uh just under a slight variation of conditions. So this is a very uh, interesting system. <clears throat> so the work I'm presenting here uh, is done uh, collaboration with uh, the people uh, at MIT. Uh, Noor and Hiroki are postdocs. Uh, Vlad Kozi is my uh, student. Uh, Finishing up, looking for postdoc positions. Uh, we also collaborated uh, with uh, Nikito Koshino uh, in, in Japan. Uh, and a lot of the uh, discussions with uh, Pablo's uh, group. So uh, we all know that uh, graphene is a uh, two dimensional sheet of carbon atoms. And uh, in this pristine form, it's actually a very good conductor uh, despite being uh, one atom uh, thick. So uh, the electrons uh, in graphene. <coughs> move at a very high uh, speed uh, with this uh, Fermi velocity of almost 10 to the 6 meter per second. <clears throat> and uh, it has extremely high mobility, uh, 100 times better than uh, silicon. Uh, the carrier density can be changed by a gate voltage. And uh, because the carrier uh, mobility is so high that even at uh, <clears throat> the so-called charge neutrality point, uh, it's still a conductor down to uh, lowest temperature. Now, uh, all the uh, excitement came uh, earlier this year uh, from uh, my colleague Pablo's group uh, at MIT. Uh, so what they discovered is that uh, when graphene forms a uh, super lattice, okay, when, uh, I will describe how this happens in a minute, it turns out uh, there are interesting uh, insulating state of matter uh, uh, showing uh, a lot of uh, physics of core electron systems. And further, uh, on the uh, slight variation of conditions, when you dope this uh, insulating state, uh, superconductivity appears, and it's a highly unconventional uh, superconducting state uh, in an all-carbon uh, system. So, uh, so this is the system that uh, uh, when two layers of graphene uh, are stacked on top of each other, uh, but with a very slight variation, uh, a slight, no, very slight uh, difference in the orientation, so that it's so-called a uh, twisted bilayer graphene. The orientation of the two graphene layers are slightly twisted. And then we see that uh, just in visually, uh, this is what the structure looks like. Uh, it has this uh, long range, uh, so-called Mori pattern. Uh, the, some regions, atoms are stacked in one way. Uh, if you move uh, maybe uh, 10 nanometers apart, the stacking, local stacking uh, changes. <coughs> so this basically produces a periodic structure with a much larger unit cell. So this is what I mean by a super lattice. Okay. And uh, at very small uh, twist angles, the super lattice uh, can have more than 10,000 atoms within each uh, unit cell. And the super lattice has lattice constant, which is only order of, for example, uh, 10 of nanometers for a twist angle of one degree. And by contrast, uh, the single sheet of graphene uh, has a lattice constant on the order of uh, uh, two angstroms. Okay. So, um, uh, in such a uh, system, uh, again, uh, at charge neutrality point, uh, it remains a conductor. But changing the carrier density by a very small amount, for example, adding on the order of one electron per 100,000 atoms, is sufficient to turn this conductor into an insulating state. Okay, that's shown here. Uh, the uh, resistivity uh, goes up uh, as you lower the temperature. Okay. It occurs at low temperature. Uh, also, by another slight change of this carrier density, uh, this insulating state uh, gives way to a superconducting state. Right? So we get zero resistance uh, at low temperature. The superconducting transition temperature uh, is about uh, one Kelvin, on the order of one Kelvin. So all this uh, occurs uh, at ambient pressure, only occurs uh, near the so-called magic twist angle, uh, when the twist angle is about one degree, okay, plus minus 0.1 degree. Uh, you move a uh, twist angle away, uh, then all these phenomena disappear. Okay? So this is a, a, a very unusual phenomenon. Just such a small variation of the carrier density turns a conductor into insulator and then to a superconductor. So, so why, 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 how it happens? Uh, this is another experiment uh, that came out 
just several months ago from the Columbia University, uh, collaboration with uh, UC Santa Barbara. And uh, again, on twisted bilayer graphene, uh, at a different twist angle, this is at a higher, a larger, slightly larger twist angle. Instead of 1.1 .1 degree, it's about 1.3 degree. And in this system, uh, at ambient pressure, the, uh, as a function of the carrier density, it's always metallic. No sign of superconductivity, no sign of uh, insulators. But when uh, a pressure is applied, uh, for example, 1.3 uh, GPA, uh, we see again the superconductivity uh, and insulating states. Okay, when we uh, add just a tiny how amount. How is the pressure applied? I think it's some diamond cell. Right? That's my understanding. Like, uh, uh, yeah, I'm serious. I don't know much about the details. Probably some diamond cell that applying pressure. Okay. Yeah. But in effect, they they put a, a liquid that transmits pressure. They in, you know, right? put the uh, sample in a liquid that transmits pressure, and then they put the whole thing in a box which can be squeezed. The box is this diamond cell. It's really. I two pieces of diamond with a big like screw on the top that just pushes them closer together. Uh, great, thanks. Um, right, so uh, so so again, no, this shows right a small variation of the condition is enough to turn a conductor into uh, interesting states. Uh, so this is another system that came out about you know almost twenty years earlier. Uh, so this is this work is as little known as. Twisted biography now is widely known. Okay? So very few people know about this work. Uh, so this is a, a semiconductor system, uh, lead telluride and uh, lead uh, sulfide, or lead telluride and lead selenide. Uh, when you grow these materials at the interface, uh, it, there's an array of dislocations that shows up because of lattice mismatch. And if you look at the period of these, uh, the distance between these dislocations is again only order of 10 nanometers. Right? So very much like the size of the superlattice unit cell uh, in twisted bilayer graphene. And, uh, and again, in this system, uh, superconductivity appears at low temperature. So here, actually, it's nothing TC. It's even higher. It's about you know, 6 Kelvin. Right? So, uh, so these uh, experiments uh, uh, no, did a lot of study, and they actually concluded that uh, superconductivity in this system has a lot to do with the dislocations. Uh, for example, the superconducting transition temperature uh, is correlated with the uh, Distance between these dislocations depends on the superlattice unit cell. Okay, so at the very end of this talk, uh, I'm going to make some connections. Okay, I'll point out the similarities and differences between this system and the twisted bilayer graphene. Okay, so uh, obviously, right, this uh, system uh, is a system of many electrons, and uh, the interactions between electrons are playing a fundamental role uh, in uh, driving these uh, very uh, interesting uh, phenomena. And uh, it's also a hard problem. Uh, it involves a, a hierarchy of energy scales, a hierarchy of length scales. Right? So the fundamental constituent are uh, carbon atoms, electrons in carbon atoms, and the energy scale associated with the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the atomic orbitals, S and P orbitals in the carbon <coughs> atom, is on the order of say, 10 electron volt. Uh, and when uh, carbon atoms form this two-dimensional sheet, uh, this single layer of graphene, uh, the physics that, that we usually consider uh, in the graphene is only energy scale of one electron volt. Right? Okay, this is the energy scale where direct fermions uh, talk about appears uh, in graphene. And then by the time you come to uh, two layers of graphene, which are uh, stacked on top of each other uh, with a twist angle, then the typical energy scale goes to 100 millev. Okay, and at this very special twist angle of about one degrees, uh, there's a so-called flat band that appears which has a bandwidth of about 10 milliliton volt. And finally, uh, when you cool the system down to about uh, 1 Kelvin, all these things, uh, like an insulating state and superconductivity appears. Right? So all the way from the fundamental constituent to this emergent phenomena, uh, it spans an energy scale of five orders of magnitude. So this is kind of a challenging problem uh, for computations, uh, also for uh, theory, uh, analytical uh, understanding. Right? It involves a, a big uh, range of, of scales. So. Uh, so briefly, very briefly, you know, the carbon atom has uh, 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 electrons. Uh, they arrange themselves uh, in this so-called sigma and pi orbitals uh, when they form a graphene. So uh, the px and py orbitals, they strongly bond with each other. Uh, they form uh, these uh, so-called sigma bands that are very far away from uh, the Fermi energy, uh, while the pz orbitals, uh, these are the uh, important uh, building blocks 
to understand the electronic structure of graphene, they form the conduction and valence bands. Right? And um, uh, so this is what the band structure of graphene uh, looks like, uh, the energy as a function of momentum uh, in the so-called uh, Brillouin zone. And the low energy uh, physics, they all occur near the corner of the Brillouin zone, that form this so-called two-dimensional direct fermions uh, with zero mass. And uh, uh, this is the Hamiltonian describing the massive direct fermion. And this direct description is a good uh, uh, description all the way to the uh, scale of uh, electron volt. So here, uh, the direct formula has uh, two components, which are called sigma, uh, we use sigma z, one and minus one. They really correspond to uh, the two uh, carbon atoms forming the so-called A and B sublattices. So uh, if you look at, for example, the uh, electron wave function uh, on one sublattice, on the B sublattice, for example, it's plotted here. Uh, you see that uh, there's actually a, a very rapid variation of the phase of the wave function uh, on the lattice scale. Okay, so this uh, is telling us that although we use a continuum field theory to describe the low energy uh, excitations, uh, one should not forget that there's the actual block wave function has, uh, has an atomic part that varies on the lattice scale. Uh, also here, tau z, uh, it labels the two valleys. So there are really two different flavors of direct fermions uh, at the k and k prime values okay, in the system. Um, so when the two layers of graphing are stacked on top of each other, uh, there's an interlayer tunneling. Uh, so electron can hop from one layer to the other. Uh, this is a general form of the tunneling Hamiltonian. Uh, this uh, hopping integral is on the order of uh, 0.1 electron volt. And uh, one can uh, rewrite this tunneling Hamiltonian uh, in momentum space. And then we get this uh, form, which is a starting point of our investigation. Uh, this was actually uh, a beautiful work by uh, Alan McDonald uh, back in 2011. So, uh, so here, what happens is that um, uh, the, the, the twisted graph, bilayer graphing has a very large unit cell. So the uh, reciprocal vector of the super lattice, which is called G, uh, is very small. Right? So when electrons hop from one layer to the other, uh, they can have a momentum transfer uh, which is uh, the reciprocal vector of the super lattice, uh, and that is equal to the difference of the reciprocal vectors of the two layers, which are called G1 and G2. Okay? So um, G1 and G2 can both be uh, uh, on the atomic scale, uh, 1 over the lattice constant uh, of graphene, uh, but the difference between them can be very small. Okay? So the momentum transfer can be very small. So, um, so here, uh, uh, let me uh, describe the uh, main feature of this problem uh, in terms of electronic structure. Uh, this uh, interlayer uh, tunneling essentially hybridizes direct fermions uh, on the two layers. And, uh, and uh, this is here, this is how the uh, Brillouin zone of the super lattice is obtained. So these red and uh, blue hexagons are the Brillouin zone of the two graphing layers. And uh, this black uh, small uh, hexagon is the uh, mini Brillouin zone of the super lattice. Okay? And again, we see that the reciprocal vector of the super lattice is basically the difference of the two uh, fundamental, uh, the primitive reciprocal vectors of the two layers, of B1, uh, B1 tilde, B2 and B2 tilde. tilde. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so when the two layers are coupled, uh, there's two types of scattering processes. Uh, one is a scattering uh, uh, between uh, direct cones, uh, of the same valley, right? The two adjacent direct cones that are nearby in momentum space, only separated by a small momentum. And in this case, uh, the momentum transfer uh, is very, very small, right? It's very, very small. Uh, and in this case, the tunneling matrix element can be approximated as uh, being momentum independent. And this uh, is the most general uh, momentum independent tunneling Hamiltonian. There's amplitudes of going from A sub lattice of one layer to A sub lattice of the other layer, or from B to B or A to B, B to A. Right? So these four parameters are sufficient to uh, describe all the inter uh, all the coupling uh, from of the direct fermions of the two layers within the same valley. Uh, and also uh, because of the A and B sub lattice are uh, equivalent, right? They're both of carbon atoms. So there's a sub lattice symmetry, and that implies that. The parameters UAA is equal to UBB and UAB is equal to UBA. So really, we are talking about just two parameters. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if we consider inter-valley uh, tunneling, 
For example, uh, the drug point, drug fermion at uh, value k in layer one, uh, that tunnel all the way to uh, this here, to this point, which is a minus k prime of the other value. Uh, this kind of uh, tunneling process requires a large momentum transfer uh, on the scale of the inverse that is constant. And this really requires a very high order process, right? very high order process. And uh, that's suppressed. Uh, so essentially what happens is that uh, when you have this uh, super lattice at the small specific angles, the tunneling uh, operator is locally, uh, you can think of the, the two layers are essentially uh, homogeneous. Uh, um, but uh, if you want to transfer electrons from one valley to the opposite valley, that requires large momentum transfer, so there's destructive interference. Okay. Are you talking about just one particle transfer one particle, or one particle, interaction? One particle. Yeah. yeah, everything here is one particle transfer. So because of this distraction interference, this intervalley scattering is strongly suppressed at small two angles. So really, we should uh, treat the two valleys uh, as being independent. Okay. So, um, so now again, uh, uh, let's look at basically how the drug fermions uh, of the same valley, they hybridize with each other. Uh, there are two important energy scales here. Uh, so one is that, uh, shown in this picture, uh, when the two layers are misaligned, uh, the drag points are displaced from each other in momentum space, uh, which is given by delta k. And delta k is proportional to sine theta over 2, uh, depending on the twist angle. And this uh, gives an energy scale, okay, which is uh, uh, the direct velocity times delta k. Um, this tells us, basically, uh, when the two direct cones intersect with each other, uh, at what energy they, they meet. Uh, on the other hand, there's another energy scale, which is the interlayer coupling, uh, which I call u. right? Uh, this u is uh, largely uh, twist angle independent. So now comparing these two energy scales tells us there are two regimes. Uh, when the uh, direct point displacement, E theta, is larger than the tunneling term u, uh, that's so-called the perturbative regime. And we can really think of the, uh, the physics as you know, two direct fermions that, that hybridize uh, only when they uh, meet each other in energy. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, when the uh, Interlayer tunneling is larger than the uh, direct uh, energy displacement. Uh, this occurs at very small twist angles, below 2 degrees. Then we really enter the so-called non-perturbed regime. Uh, and this is all pointed out in the work by McDonald. And in this non-perturbed regime, uh, really, the direct fermions of the two layers strongly hybridize with each other. Okay, and, and, uh, and uh, new features arise. Yeah, you. Yeah, in the previous slide, you really mean to compare ether and u. Ether and u, yeah, sorry. Yeah, ether and u, yeah. Okay, okay so now uh, I've described to you the uh, sort of the uh, physics from carbon to graphene to twist graphene, and let's now move on to uh, twist graphene at special angles. Okay. Um, so um, using this so called continuum model, uh, where uh, only relying on this. Uh, two parameters, uh, tunneling between uh, the same lattice or the tunneling uh, between two different sub lattices, which we call u and u prime, the band structure of two-spatial graphene can be computed. Right? So, you know, although the unit cell is huge, consists of 10,000 atoms, the band structure can be all be computed with just these two parameters. It's quite amazing. Uh, and in this uh, beautiful work by McDonald, uh, they used one further simplification that uh, they choose u equal u prime. And uh, this really applies to so-called non-distorted structure when the two graphene layers are just perfectly uh, hexagons and they are just uh, rotated right to each other. And then what basically happens is that uh, the uh, area where the A side coupled to A side and the area where A side couples to B sides are essentially equal. That's why the two types of tunneling are of equal strength. And in this case, uh, they computed the band structure for different twist angles, and this is shown here. Okay. And in all cases, you see that there remains direct fermions uh, near charge and twilight point, but the direct velocity is strongly reduced. Okay. So, so I thought the cone, the direct cone required uh, inversion symmetry yeah, to be preserved. Yeah, in this continuum uh, model, there in, is. But not in reality. Not in reality. Not in reality. Right, right. We'll, we'll come to this point later. Yeah. So the direct fermion is present. Uh, and. Uh, um, and, and the continuum model uh, is actually a good description as small twist angles. So, so that's, that's okay. So the drag formulas are present, and the drag velocity is strongly reduced. Right? We see the drag velocity is strongly reduced. Again, this is because of the interlayer uh, hybridization. Uh, uh, 
But then something very strange happens around one degree. Right? And uh, you see that a nearly flat band appears. So these authors you know, uh, notice this phenomena, and they, they uh, call it the magic twist angle. And now the flat band appears at this angle. And, um, and this actually inspired uh, the ex later experiments to explore uh, twist ballet graphene around this, this angle. Um, now, one thing I want to point out, right, which is I, I think it's important, is that um, within this uh, particular parametrization where u equal u prime, this flat band is really connected to higher bands. There's no clear energy gap between the flat band and the higher bands. In particular, uh, around this magic angle, uh, the flat band actually touches with the higher bands. The gap really vanishes. Okay? So this should be a cause for concern, okay? Because um, uh, you know, if we want to sort of uh, uh, write down a model that only describes the flat bands, right, we are implicitly assuming that other bands are far away in energy. Uh, we, can, we can neglect them, but that's not the case here. Or another way of thinking about it that, you know, um, you know, you know just to take any time binding model you like, you can artificially plot the band structure in the mini Brown zone by doing band folding. But after you do band folding, it will appear that you have a flat, you have a very narrow band. But we know that we're just uh, fooling ourselves. Right? So, uh, so only when the uh, lowest bands and higher bands are separated by an energy gap, uh, this 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 physics of narrow bands uh, becomes uh, becomes important. Okay, so. Um, so uh, one of the things we look at uh, is to look at um, this, this energy gap okay, between the lower bands and higher bands. Uh, it was pointed out already a while back that uh, lattice distortions are very important uh, when the twist angle, especially when the twist angle is small. So, um, so here's what it looks like if I'm looking at a side view. right? You see the lattice actually become corrugated. So the distance between the two graphene layers varies. Right? varies. And uh, what essentially happens uh, is the following, that when we look at the stacking of the two layers, uh, in some regions in the uh, tube lattice, where we have two graphene that are perfectly aligned, this is called A stacking, and in other regions, uh, the two graphene layers are rotated by 60 degrees, they're called AB stackings. Um, so for a perfect uh, graphene sheets that are just uh, rotated relative to each other, you have equal areas of A stacking and AB stacking, uh, but on the other hand, uh, it is known that the AB stacking is thermodynamic much more stable than A stacking. Right? So, we, uh, so what this lattice distortion does is to enlarge the regions of AB stacking and shrink the region of A stacking. So energetically, this is more favorable. And um, the uh, variation of the uh, distance between the two layers is actually quite substantial. You know, from the A region to AB region, the distance varies by more than 10%. Okay? So this is a very important effect. So, um, um, so in this work with Koshino, uh, we look at the effect of this lattice distortion on the electronic structure. And uh, uh, because the area of the A region is different, is bigger than the area of the, the, the area of the AB region is bigger than the area of the A region, the tunneling matrix element UAB is kind of bigger than UAA. And, uh, uh, and uh, the lot of calculation uh, by Koshino, uh, we, uh, found that uh, this parameter u prime and u are given here. These are uh, computed uh, exactly uh, using just the fact the distance between the two layers uh, varies uh, by about 10 percent. So these are the parameters uh, that uh, corresponds to this uh, system. And here you see that uh, if we look at the band structure again, <coughs> now this flat band is separated from the higher bands by a gap of about uh, 14 millilitron volt. And this compares well with experiments. Uh, the experiments, uh, when we have four electrons uh, per super lattice cell, you see there's energy gap. And this energy gap is temperature independent. So this is attributed as single particle gap uh, due to the formation of the super lattice. Okay? So, uh, so this uh, energy scale is about a few tens of milliatron volt. So essentially, the punchline here is that uh, lattice distortion opens a gap between the flat band and the higher bands. So we can really focus on the flat bands themselves. And also, uh, the flat band, although I call it flat band, uh, it still has an, uh, a bandwidth of about 8 uh, milli electron volt, around 10 milli electron volt. And there are really four bands that are uh, tangled up together. And these four comes from the two valleys and coming from the two sublattices, okay, the AB sublattice. Okay, so now we're going to zoom in and look at the physics in this flat band. Um, 
So uh, the two values are related by time rule symmetry, and because the inter-valley hybridization uh, is negligible, so we can really uh, sort of uh, divide these flat bands into two, uh, one uh, uh, two per, per valley. We're going to look at two valleys uh, independently. And uh, the, because uh, there's no uh, inversion symmetry, it means that although time rules of symmetry uh, relates states of k and minus k, they also uh, relate the two valleys. So within each valley, the energy momentum relation uh, is not k to minus k symmetric. So these are the main key, uh, features. Uh -huh. And this feature uh, really holds uh, not only at a magic angle, but also uh, uh, it's more general as small twist angles. Okay, so this is the uh, zooming in of the flat band uh, at this 1.1 uh, degree. And uh, uh, here are these uh, bands uh, shown. Uh, and what you see is that uh, depending on the carrier density, the Fermi surface is going to change uh, dramatically. So near the Chapman Charlie point, uh, we have direct pockets right, uh, at the two corners of the mini brown zone. Uh, as we increase the carrier density, uh, eventually near the complete filling of the narrow bands uh, that corresponds to four electron per supercell, uh, we will end up with Fermi pockets that are surrounding the gamma point. Right. So uh, there's really a change of the Fermi surface uh, from pockets surrounding K to pockets surrounding uh, the gamma points. And uh, this leads to a kind of a Lipschitz transition uh, where the Fermi surface topology changes, and, and that leads to my whole similarities. So the physics is going to be very different uh, when we're near charging charity or near the complete feeling of the uh, of these narrow bands. Okay, so um, this type of literature transition is actually seen from Hall measurement. So this is data from uh, Corradine and Andrea Young's group, and uh, this is at uh, 1.3 degrees, and this is uh, uh, the Hall density. Uh, so this is charging charity point, and as we increase the carrier density, we see that uh, there's a, a here, there's a sign change. Right. So this indicates uh, a changing from you know, hole to electron carriers. Right. So this uh, is. This is actually experiment? It's actually experiment. Wow. Yes. Actual experiment. Yeah. So it's pretty here. Yeah. Right. So next time I teach undergrad physics solids, I can use this example. Right. If you completely feel a band, you really change from electron to holes. Yeah. So this happens. And notice that this uh, Lipschitz transition occurs actually very close to half filling. And this uh, so-called two electron per supercell is where the metal insulated transition occurs when pressure is applied to this uh, device. Okay, so we really have Lipschitz transition near uh, two electron per supercell. Um, also, uh, when these pockets start to merge at the Lipschitz transition, we expect the so-called Van Helsing similarity, where the dispersion uh, become a, a saddle, uh, has a saddle-like uh, dispersion. And this, this kind of whole similarity, okay, this, this, this kind of a, a this transition leads to a, a, a peak in the denser states. And that's also seen uh, in experiments. Uh, this is from Eva Andrews' group, uh, actually uh, almost 10 years earlier. Uh, uh, they were looking at the STM tunneling into just graphite. But uh, so for reasons I don't know, but uh, the top, for uh, naturally graphite, the top layer is very often detached from the next layer and it's free to rotate. So in some regions, they find uh, you know, different twist angles. Okay, so this is uh, uh, in this region, for example, the twist angle is about 1.8 degree, and you see there's a Van Helsing similarity, right? In the conduction band, Van Helsing similarity in the valence band. That's these are what uh, one over square root similarity. One this over is a, e in 2D. In 2D, what is it? It's about in 2D. It's stronger I, than the log. In 2D, uh, so Van Helsing similarity in 2D. Probably one over square root. Probably. probably yeah. Right, so um, so uh, so this by hosting there, uh, you know, in this 1.8 degree sample, they are about 50 milliton volt apart from each other. This gives you an idea of the energy scale uh, for 1.8 degree uh, uh, device. And now uh, another region, uh, this uh, is the tunneling data at 1.1 degree. And now you see this by hosting there is uh, still there, but they are only 10 milliton EV apart. Right? This is again showing that the the energy scale goes down as you go to smaller twist angles. Okay, <clears throat> okay so, um, so now I've described this as the electronic structure uh, in crystal valley graphene, as well as the emergence of narrow bands at the magic angle. Uh, so let's now move on to the insulating state and superconducting states. And notice that um, the insulating state and superconductivity has a 
characteristic temperature about one Kelvin, which is still much smaller than the, the bandwidth of the narrow band. Right? So this uh, encourages us to uh, think about uh, this weak versus strong coupling approach to this problem. Right? So, um, so yeah, to just to uh, show that how the resistivity looks like uh, in this uh, device, for example, the resistivity is still metallic-like. Okay, above you know, maybe five or eight Kelvin. Right? It's a, it's a, it's metallic. Uh, and then only at low temperature, for example, the resistivity starts to shoot up. Right? This insulating-like behavior, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, you know also sometimes it goes smacking depending on uh, where the carrier density is. So this really, uh, to me, it means that uh, uh, the fact that uh, the uh, the energy scale associated with insulating state and superconductivity are much smaller than the bandwidth is enough to rule out the scenario of the strong model insulator. Uh, in the scenario where the uh, Hubbard detection U is much bigger than bandwidth, uh, we will expect insulating behavior uh, already on the for temperatures on the order of the bandwidth. But this is not the case here, right? So, um, so th uh, this encourages us to uh, think about maybe a weak coupling approach first. So, um, so this is the uh, work I'm uh, described uh, with uh, Hiroki Isobe and uh, Noah Yuan. Um, so the fact that the low singularity uh, is very close to uh, half heading, where this metal insulator transition was found at low temperature, uh, it uh, sort of leads us to, to speculate that there may be some physics associated with uh, these high singularities and the nesting that are present uh, in this case. So, uh, so this is uh, uh, what the Fermi circuits look like, okay? at least what we think it looks like. Um, and you see that these are Fermi surfaces coming from two different valleys. They are really independent of each other. And you see that there are these drag pockets surrounding the uh, drag points. And at this my hope singularity, the pockets from two corners of the mini world zone start to touch each other. So this is the my hope singularity. Okay? And if we are slightly below that, we have the pockets like this. We have a, a, a density slightly above that. We get single pockets surrounding the gamma point. Okay? So, um, so in all cases, right, there's a, uh, either diverging or large density states uh, near these uh, regions. Uh, we call those hotspots. So there are in total six hotspots. They're all related to each other by a symmetry. So uh, the model I'm going to present is a basically a hotspot model. Uh, we're going to consider uh, pockets near these uh, hotspots. And there are all kinds of uh, electron-electron interactions uh, scattering between these hotspots. And also, if you look at uh, uh, the uh, Fermi surface, you notice there's also nesting. Uh, for example, uh, there is a nesting between uh, these uh, two hotspots. Uh, the Fermi surface are nearly parallel to each other. So there's a uh, uh, sort of a density wave uh, nesting uh, at wave vector Q minus. Uh, if you look closely, there's also density wave nesting at wave vector Q prime. And finally, there is a sort of superconducting particle-particle uh, nesting at a wave vector Q plus. Okay, so there are uh, different types of uh, nesting instabilities uh, are present. Um, so this uh, leads to uh, all kinds of scattering processes, uh, and uh, that's written here. There are in total nine different scattering processes uh, within this hotspot model. Uh, it looks horribly complicated, uh, but after a while, you know, uh, a simple picture started to emerge. So there are really um, two types of interactions. Uh, the density interaction uh, that are present uh, come from the long range part of the Coulomb interaction. And, um, and these density interactions can be coming from the same direct fermions of the same valley or from direct fermions of two different valleys, which we call intra and inter valley density interaction. They are written here. Okay? Um, and then uh, there's also uh, the so called inter valley exchange interaction that comes from the short part of the uh, short range interaction. And these are processes where, for example, you scatter uh, electrons from one valley to the other. Okay? Um, so uh, because the carrier density in the system is so low, uh, the short range interaction uh, is um, going to be much weaker than the long range interaction. So therefore, uh, to a good approximation, the inter-valley exchange interaction can be neglected. So this is very much like in series of X-tonic insulators at low carrier density, the long range Coulomb interaction is the most dominant. Uh, and when the smaller exchange interaction is uh, neglected, uh, there's, there's an in, emergent conservation law. Right? There is a charge and spin conservation within each value. Okay. 
this, this emergent in large symmetry uh, will lead to degeneracies between different states. Do you, do you yeah. estimate the, the relative contribution, since lattice distortion played a big role in right. your story to begin right. with, right. just good old uh, electron lattice vibration interactions? What you're dealing with. Yeah, you're saying the phono, electron phono interaction. Yeah. Right, right. But the, those, uh, those lattice distortions are still uh, long wavelengths definitions. So they do not a uh, long you mean wavelength. large Q. No. Inter so inter valley exchange interaction requires large Q. That's why they are small. Well, you're looking within the, yeah, that's right. You're looking within each little thingy. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, so this is the uh, the uh, you know uh, RG uh, equation. So basically, when uh, these different interactions are all present, they may enhance or suppress each other, uh, and that's captured by uh, an, an RG uh, equations. Uh, so um, so again, this equation is complicated, but really there are two types of uh, processes going on. Uh, there's a BCS correction that drive the RG flow, uh, and that's just like in any theory of metals. And in that case, when the uh, bare interaction is attractive, they grow under RG. And if they're repulsive, uh, they, uh, they become much weaker. Right? They, they die out eventually. Uh, but now, because of the nesting, there are new contributions to the uh, RG equation. And that are uh, terms that comes with these parameters D. So D is what we call the nesting vectors. If the uh, Fermi pockets are exactly parallel to each other, then this nesting parameter is 1. It means that the, the uh, nesting uh, related correction is as big as the BCS uh, correction. But in general, the nesting is not perfect, so, um, so we, we treat uh, these as parameters uh, which are smaller than one in general. Okay, so, um, so it's because of the presence of this nesting uh, that the repulsive interactions has a chance to grow, okay, and that is going to play a, a role. Okay. So without these nestings, the repulsive interactions are all going to become uh, weaker at lower energy. And this type of approach was uh, was used as a long history. It was used uh, for cuprates, uh, and more recently, it was applied to modulator graphene. And uh, yeah, so we, we use this type of analysis to study this problem of just valley graphene. And um, so here's uh, what the RG flow looks like. And uh, and in this case, I've chosen uh, all the uh, bare uh, density interaction to be equal. Uh, this is reasonable if the interaction is a long range chrome interaction. Uh, so we set all the smaller exchange interactions <coughs> to be zero, uh, as a, just as a starting point. And we see that uh, that some of these uh, inter-valley density interactions, they decay, while uh, one of them grows. Okay, And the one that grows uh, is, and this is a very general RG flow diagram. And, you know, we tried the many different uh, initial parameters. And, uh, and what emerged is a very simple, uh, a very simple uh, understanding. So basically, if we look at um, these uh, hotspots, uh, these are the interactions associated with the uh, intervalley density uh, interactions. These are scattering associated with intervalley density interactions. And you see that the G22 are the scattering processes that involve hotspots that are not related by time rules symmetry. While all the two other processes, they always involve a pair of electrons at opposite momentum. So for those that involve uh, electrons at opposite momentum, their RG flow uh, uh, acquired, you know, uh, their RG flow is driven by both BCS process and by density wave process, and one is uh, uh, make it grow, the other make it shrink. So when you combine them, uh, because of the BCS nesting is, is always stronger, so that's why they, they, they become weaker. Okay, despite the presence of uh, density wave nesting, uh, yeah, the BCS uh, uh, correction is, is dominates and they. They decay at lower energy, while for this uh, this process G22, uh, it involves a pair of electrons uh, that are not related by time rule symmetry, so uh, they only grow under the nesting condition. There's no BCS correction uh, that contributes to this process. Okay, so this is very general. So, um, so from the RG flow of the uh, coupling constants, uh, we also computed the susceptibility for various channels. And uh, we see that, for example, here, two types of susceptibilities grow okay, under RG. One is associated with density wave, either charge or spin density wave, at this uh, nesting wave vector Q2. You know, the, the G22 process basically involves uh, two uh, adjacent hotspots. 
and uh, there is a dense to wave uh, susceptibility grows at this wave vector connecting these hotspots. And another type of uh, uh, susceptibility that grows is the supernatural susceptibility. Uh, but now this is uh, uh, has opposite signs at the two hotspots, uh, two and three. So it's uh, superconducting stability in the D wave or P wave channel. Okay. So this is a very general uh, uh, phase of RG flow equation in our model. And uh, what leads to is a phase arm uh, shown here. Uh, here the, the color tells us the susceptibility. And the two parameters are basically the uh, nesting uh, conditions, tells us how good the nesting conditions are. And uh, we see that at a very strong nesting condition, right, when the nesting parameters are large, uh, we get density waves, either charge or spin density wave at the wave vector Q minus. And if the nesting is weaker, uh, then we get superconductivity, either D or P wave. And again, these are general results. And one thing I want to notice is that uh, this nesting parameters, you know, it's hard to know uh, exactly. But one interesting uh, sort of a, uh, feature here is that, uh, for example, this D, D2 minus and D1 minus that tell you that the nesting condition associated with different wave vectors, ordering of different wave vectors. Uh, even when we start with a case where the nesting condition is more favorable for ordering a wave vector Q prime, because the in, entire infection uh, only grows uh, at the wave vector Q minus, that, uh, that in the end, we find that only dense wave states are wave vector Q minus, connecting nearest neighbor adjacent hotspots. Okay, this is a, this is a robust feature. Um, and again, we see that the degeneracy between charge or spin density wave uh, and the degeneracy between D and P wave superconductivity, and that comes from the fact that we have neglected this smaller inter-valley exchange infection. So uh, under this condition, there's an emergent U2 cross U2 symmetry. Charge and spin are conserved on each valley, and that is sufficient to guarantee an exact degeneracy. So we expect the degeneracy to be lifted uh, when the smaller exchange interaction is included. Wait, I'm sorry, that degeneracy is an exact statement about the model with the... the when the inter exchange interaction is unneglected, okay, yeah. So and it's I not think a consequence of just one loop. Uh, it's not a consequence of just one loop. It's a very exact, it's exact, yeah. And, that's, and, and, that's, and that is not tied to this approach, uh, hot spot approach. You know, even if we include the full model, the full Fermi surface, uh, as long as the uh, exchange interaction uh, is neglected, there's an exact U2 cross U2 symmetry. Okay, so now let's look at the, uh, the spectrum, the uh, positive spectrum in the sense wave state of wave vector Q minus, and this is plotted here. Uh, this wave vector uh, is close to uh, period four. Okay, it's a four times four reconstruction, and uh, we see that uh, uh, it gaps the full Fermi surface. Okay, if the nesting condition is good, uh, that the full Fermi surface is gapped. Uh, there's also a single pocket. Uh, above the gap, and uh, two nearly degenerate pockets below the gap with much heavier mass. So this compares well with the quantum oscillation data that's shown here. Basically, near this half filling uh, in insulating states, uh, when we move, uh, it has an energy gap. And as we uh, dope slightly away, uh, quantum oscillation appears, uh, and these lambda levels only has a two-fold degeneracy. So that's consistent with a single pocket that is spin degenerate. Okay. Now. Uh, Around the same time as our work, there's a work from Ashwin's group, again, also exploring the density wave fluctuations that drive superconductivity. A lot of our conclusions are similar. Uh, however, uh, the difference is here that they consider Fermi surface that is more uh, triangle shaped. And in this case, uh, they uh, consider a density wave ordering at a different wave vector, which approximately has a period of two, the two times two reconstruction. And in this case, uh, this charge density wave state does not lead to an insulating state. It actually leads to a, a metal. Okay. And in fact, we also tried ourselves at wave vector Q prime. We never found an insulating state. But a wave vector Q minus with a you know, four times four uh, reconstruction, we get an insulating state uh, easily. Okay. So, um, okay. So, what are the uh, sort of conclusions we can say from this uh, model study? I think at the very minimal, uh, in our uh, picture, uh, the superconducting state and dense wave state are really driven by the same interactions, uh, the very positive cooling interaction, uh, and especially the long-range part of cooling interaction. And uh, uh, these inter interactions, they grow at low temperature uh, due to the presence of nesting. Uh, so in that sense, 
you know, the, both states that come have the same origin, the same origin. Now, which phase is realized really depends in our model, at least depends on the uh, Fermi surface conditions, you know, how good the netting is. So, um, right. So this, we think, at least can explain why, for example, in uh, resistivity, we see that there's first a sign towards insulin states, but then at a lower temperature, it goes to nothing. Right? The, the, the susceptibility for both density wave and assuming instability grows uh, under RG. Uh, but uh, here, for example, uh, at the, the lowest energy scale, uh, one susceptibility diverges first. Right? And which one diverges first uh, depends on uh, details. OK. So um, yeah, so here you know, I'm showing that many other works uh, all coming out around the same time, uh, that, you know, exploring the scenario of density waves uh, for the uh, insulating states. Uh, okay, so now let me move on to the, the, the last part of my talk. How much time do I have? Um, Ten minutes. Ten? Okay, perfect, yeah. All right, so I'm um, explaining sort of this weak coupling approach starting from the Fermi surface instability. And now let's explore uh, another uh, limit where we think about a strong coupling. Uh, and again, here, uh, as a first step, we would like to build a effective model that only describes the flat bands uh, without uh, the need to worry about higher bands because higher bands are separated by a, a large energy gap. So, um, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to uh, look at the band structure. We're going to analyze the symmetries of these lowest uh, flat bands, and we're going to infer the winding optals, the center of winding optals, and the symmetries of winding optals. And also, uh, we're going to compute these winding optals explicitly, and that allows us to build a type binding model that fully reproduces the band structure. So one comment I want to make right, is that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, one can compute the, the band structure in various ways. And this continuum model that I've described is a very good approximation. It's a very good, it's a very good uh, starting point. Uh, you know, it allows us to compute the band structure, for example, using just two parameters. Uh, however, when we talk about winding orbitals, they are really defined only for uh, lattice systems, for real materials defined on lattice. So it's impossible to <coughs> define winding orbitals for a continuum theory. There's no such thing. Okay. So I think that is where a lot of confusion recently in literature come from. OK, so, um, so now I have to, uh, when I describe the winding optos, I have to specify uh, the structure that I'm studying. And uh, as a starting point, let me look at this twist-file layer graphing we so-called you know, D3 structure, where uh, we stack two layer graphings with a registered uh, atom. And in this case, the point group has so-called D3 symmetry, the 3 4 rotation. Uh, uh, around the z-axis, two for rotation around the uh, x-axis, and uh, you know we look at the uh, band symmetries at all high symmetry points in the momentum space, and I, I don't go, I don't want to go the, through the details, uh, and then we try to enumerate all possible combinations of vanilla centers and vanilla symmetries, so that this kind of a band symmetry can be obtained, and there's only one solution, which is that the vanilla optos uh, has to be located uh, at so-called A, B, and B A regions. They form a Huntington lattice. And uh, at every side of the Huntington lattice, there are two degenerate winding orbitals. They are uh, of px py symmetry. They are uh, related to each other by a three four rotation around that site. Okay. So, uh, so this, in this earlier work, we can do this conclusion uh, that's based entirely on symmetry conservations. And then uh, recently, in uh, collaboration with uh, Koshino, uh, who's an expert on these uh, twisted biolithographing uh, joint structures, and we explicitly constructed these are binary uh, Again, uh, there are two values that essentially do not couple to each other. So these winding orbitals are constructed for each value, okay, for each value. And uh, uh, this is what the winding functions look like. And I'm plotting the winding functions uh, on, for one layer, uh, for the other, next layer, uh, for A sub lattice and for the B sub lattice. That's why you see four different plots. And in all cases, uh, when we look at the angular momentum, of these winding orbitals, we find the angular momentum is one or minus one. It has a symmetry of px and py. And, uh, um, and notice that, for example, uh, the angular momentum really has two parts. There's one part associated with the envelope function, which I call uh, L envelope. Uh, but also, uh, remember that, the, the, as I said earlier, that the uh, block wave function at the direct point on each layer has rapid phase variations uh, around the, uh, within the Length of the unit cell, that contributes to so-called uh, angular momentum associated with block wave functions. So only when you add up them, you get the 
correct uh, photo angular momentum. And uh, the correct angular momentum is plus minus one, which confirms this, this Px plus Ipy uh, symmetry. Uh, also, uh, one thing to notice that although the uh, one year orbitals are centered around the so called AB and BA regions, uh, the peaks, the weights of the one year orbital, uh, are actually away from the, the center. Right? It has a three peak structure, and these peaks are actually centered around the so called A regions. And that's <coughs> also consistent with uh, previous calculations. Are these money functions for the, the band structure you obtain, for the which north? has the, the strain so that the, the central bands are separated from the other ones? Yes, that's right. The, the, for the, for the uh, set of uh, four bands that are separate from all other bands. Right, but that means it was built on the band structure that had this strain effect. That you uh, has a strain effect. Exactly, exactly, absolutely, exactly. Yeah. This is for the case of a 1.5 degree um, uh, twist angle uh, with <coughs> this corrugation effect included. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> Okay, so and all here, uh, uh, so once we know the one year uh, orbitals, we can uh, explicitly compute, uh, we can do Fourier transform to get the type binding model. Right? So this is a type binding model, you know, with, without any fitting. Right? So once we know the one year orbital, we, we compute the type binding explicitly. So, uh, so this figure represents all the hoppings uh, on this uh, uh, Huntington lattice, right? So the effective model now is defined by Huntington lattice. And so, uh, so suppose I have electrons starting at the center in this green uh, spot and it has amplitudes of hopping onto various sites. Right? And we see that the uh, hopping amplitude decays rapidly. There are only three dominant hopping processes. Uh, one is nearest neighbor hopping, it's real. And another is this hopping uh, amplitude T5, okay, it's also real. Uh, uh, last term is this hopping we call T2, that's purely imaginary, okay? It's hopping here, but right? also it's you know, shown here. Uh, so this uh, hopping T1, uh, this real hopping T1 and this imagined hopping uh, T2 is already, uh, you know, we already inferred this in our earlier work. And now we, from this calculation, we know explicitly the amplitude of these hopping processes. Now with this model, uh, you get a, uh, because we, um, uh, we start from a twist value bar pin with D3 <laughs> symmetry, our type binary model obviously satisfies the exact D3 symmetry. But what's interesting is that uh, uh, if you look at this model more carefully, you notice that some of the terms, for example, hopping from the uh, origin to this side, second neighbor T, uh, is very, very small. Right? Uh, in the lattice with three, four rotation, if you write down the most general type binding model compatible with the D3 symmetry, uh, the second neighbor hopping does not have to, have to be zero. Does not have to be zero. Now, why we get uh, uh, almost uh, zero hopping? Uh, you know, so when symmetry is large, generally you expect to be present, right? Now, this turned out to be, has to do with the emergent symmetries uh, in the continuum model, okay? Uh, because, you know, the band structure that we use come from the continuum model, right? So, uh, so the continuum model actually has a higher symmetries. Uh, it has this uh, valley conservation symmetry, uh, the U1. Uh, it has a spin SU2 symmetry, it has time rose symmetry. Uh, that has all been considered uh, so far. But also, the continuum model, in addition to the D3 symmetry, has an additional a uh, two-four rotation symmetry that uh, makes the point group not D3 but D6, okay, not D6, okay. So it turns out that uh, this D6 symmetry is naturally implemented in our type binding model, but it's, uh, but it's implemented in a very uh, clever way that uh, took us a while to figure out. Um, so what happens is that uh, 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 this, this uh, additional element in this D6 group, which involves a two-four rotation around the z-axis, uh, this operation, uh, this symmetry is present in our primary <coughs> model, but it doesn't uh, simply commute with the U1 symmetry. Instead of being a direct product, it's a semi-direct product, meaning that uh, when I, um, the commutator relation between this C2 rotation around the z-axis and the value U1 symmetry uh, is modified. Okay, instead of uh, right here. So if I have two operators which commute, then I expect A times B is equal to B times A. Uh, but in a semi-direct product, a times b is equal to some phase factor e to the i theta, a b times b a. Okay. So, uh, so in in, in our uh, model, uh, this uh, this additional two-fold rotation symmetry, uh, it uh, uh, has a twist uh, commutator relation with the value symmetry. Okay. And in this way, all the symmetries are satisfied. 
Okay, so, um, so finally, uh, once we have this uh, winding orbitals, we can also uh, project the Coulomb interaction uh, or whatever interaction you like uh, onto these uh, flat bands, and we can explicitly construct an extended Hubble <coughs> model. And um, so here are the results. Uh, there are two types of uh, interactions. One is the dense, dense interaction, and the other is the exchange interaction. Uh, the um, largest interactions are dense interactions. And it turns out that uh, uh, the dense interactions are not just on site, but it involves uh, uh, neighboring sites. And in particular, uh, when we uh, look at the uh, magnitude of these interactions, on site interaction, first neighbor, second neighbor, all the way to third neighbor, they roughly fall into this ratio of 3, 2, 1, 1. So what this tells us is that the dominant uh, density interaction can be written in this way, as also pointed out, uh, argued for uh, in earlier work by uh, Santo and Ashley. But basically, you take the uh, total charge around every hexagon, and there's energy cost associated with that. And this uh, makes sense because the uh, peaks of the binary functions are located in the AA region. Okay, so basically, this the sum over charges around the hexagon essentially counts the actual charge density uh, in the AA spawns. So um, with this, uh, let me just summarize. Uh, all I have to say with the crystal graphene that uh, uh, there's insulating and superadding states. Uh, in our picture, the insulating states is a dense wave, it can either be a charge or a swing dense wave. And the superadding states uh, is either B wave or P wave. Uh, the degeneracy between these uh, cases are due to the uh, emergent uh, valley symmetry. Uh, it will be lifted by the small interaction by exchange interaction. Uh, there are uh, various ways. Uh, I think uh, on the kernel side, the dense wave, charge dense wave can be detected by STM tunneling or by some nonlinear IV. The swing dense wave can be potentially be, be um, detected through the scanning squid, local squid. Um, uh, you know, people already asked the question, electron phone interaction, I think this is a very interesting and important problem. Okay, it needs more study. Uh, and uh, you know, what is the phases of this cluster Hubble model, these are all open questions. If you're doing geology, which is what you're doing, right. it's in one of the Gs. <laughs> one of the Gs, yeah, the bare value. value. What are the bare value is, yes, yes. absolutely. Yeah. So bare the values. Uh, so one last thing, no, I promise to come back to this this uh, system of a uh, totally different system. Right? These are the, the experiments I mentioned uh, um, that uh, let telluride and let sulfide heterostructures. Now, uh, actually, we look at this system uh, a few years back. And in this system, what happens is that, uh, um, you know, as I said, there's an array of dislocations, right, with a distance of about 10 nanometers. And uh, that these materials are, some of these materials are actually uh, topological uh, insulators protected by crystal symmetry. So at the interface, uh, there are Dirac fermions. Uh, at least we think there are Dirac fermions. And uh, these Dirac fermions actually uh, respond to strain. So strain acts as a pseudomagnetic field, uh, very much like in graphene, very much like graphene. Okay? And uh, at this interface, uh, this location generates a periodic uh, variation of strain. Okay? That corresponds to uh, a periodic variation of the magnetic field, pseudomagnetic fields. And that actually leads to a flat band as well. You see that the drag points, uh, the drag velocity has been strongly reduced, and uh, flat band appears. So we think that this may uh, explain the presence of interface repetitivity in those systems. Now the difference is that uh, in this system, uh, the cooling interaction is strongly screened. Right? This semiconductor has a very small band gap, so the dielectric constant is large. Uh, so, so most likely, it's going to be here comes from electron phonons. And second, at least so far, there's no sign of any insulating states. Okay, it's a simulating state with TC around the six or seven Kelvin, uh, but there's no sign of. of of any uh, insulating states. But I think, in general, I think the general question is that if we have a system of direct fermions, uh, that there's a various ways we can achieve a flat bands, and, uh, uh, and interesting things can happen when direct fermions are placed in flat bands. Thank you.